Ninety miles off the Chinese coast sits the island of Taiwan, modern, prosperous, democratic, and the only place whose fate could lead to a war between the United States and China. That is the one issue, as the Chinese constantly remind us, and as American strategists also acknowledge, uh, the one issue that can lead to conflict, to military conflict between the United States uh, and China. Beijing claims Taiwan as a breakaway province, won't recognize its elected government, has blocked it from taking a higher international profile, and through military exercises like these, has repeatedly signaled its willingness to use force to prevent the island from becoming independent. The United States remains Taiwan's best friend and the leading supplier of weapons to its armed forces. Ever since President Jimmy Carter broke diplomatic ties with Taiwan to establish them with Beijing in 1979, the U.S. has maintained a vibrant, unofficial relationship with the island and kept open the possibility of coming to Taiwan's aid if China attacked. Our policy towards Taiwan has been consistent over three decades and seven presidents. We have a one-China policy based on the three joint communiques and the Taiwan Relations Act. We do not support Taiwan independence and oppose unilateral actions by either side to change the status quo. Yet Taiwan's transformation into a vibrant democracy did change the status quo, leading to the election as president in 2000 of Chen Shui-bian, a strong supporter of Taiwan independence. As Chen sought to push Taiwan further away from the mainland, Beijing responded with a major military buildup across the Taiwan Strait. For its part, the Bush administration was furious with what it saw as Chen's needlessly provocative policies. This past May, however, a moderate, Ma Ying-jeou, who campaigned on a platform of improving relations with China, succeeded Chen as president. As Washington heaved a sigh of relief, representatives of Ma's Kuomintang party held high-level meetings with Chinese leaders, leading to a sharp reduction in tensions between the two sides. There is a uh, complicated, uh, very dynamic process underway now uh, to try to move that relationship in both Beijing and Taipei to a basis where military conflict becomes a non-starter. While supporting efforts at reconciliation, Washington will have to make tough decisions on future arms sales to Taiwan. Balancing out the need to boost the island's defenses with the risk that such steps could lead Beijing to put the brakes on the thaw. In its final months, the Bush administration put off a decision to sell the island F-16 fighters, leading to criticism from conservative Republicans. I think it's very important to go forward with arms sales that we promised to Taiwan uh, seven years ago, as well as new requests Taiwan has made for F-16 aircraft in order to restore the air balance in the Taiwan Strait. And I think that uh, continuing to try to improve Taiwan's military capabilities is very much in the U.S. interests, both so that China doesn't get tempted to use force, that Taiwan is a really hard nut to, to crack, uh, as well as, uh, so in case there ever is uh, a conflict, Taiwan's forces are, are able to defend themselves. Such an approach, however, carries its own dangers. If the Chinese continue their military buildup, which they almost certainly will, uh, the U.S. will inc be inclined to try to increase the level of spending of arms and s s assistance for, for Taiwan. And you still have that, that potential for a very dangerous dynamic reemerging. It's going to take continued careful management again to deal with this kind of, with this issue. Beijing's continued deployment of a large number of missiles across the Taiwan Strait highlights a broader concern. How the U.S. should respond to China's drive to turn the People's Liberation Army into a powerful modern military force. The PLA's budget has doubled in recent years, and U.S. appeals for more transparency about the goals of China's buildup have fallen on deaf ears. I think if you look back the past, over the past decade and you look at China's military buildup, there's not been anything quite like it since the end of the Cold War in terms of how many missiles they've deployed across the Taiwan Strait, in terms of how many submarines they've deployed 
including nuclear submarines, which have power projection capabilities. And no country in Asia, and certainly no advanced industrial country, has done anything quite like it or devoted uh, quite as much resources to a military buildup. Um, and, and that, uh, in fact, has altered the military balance in, in, uh, in, Asia, in the Asia Pacific. No, Jesus. Not all American observers, however, find Beijing's moves so alarming. I think at this stage, all we can say is that the current levels of military spending in China would be justified simply by China's backwardness in a world where we have provided conclusive evidence that modern wars are won by the country that has the better military technology. At some point, however, China could cross a line where it is building up military power in ways that go beyond defense requirements and could be used to coerce other countries. We're not there. We need to be alert to the question of whether China is crossing over that line.